Not that many philosophers had had enough interest in board games to make it a central part of their work. Of course, there has been some philosopher doing it, and actually the show that you're watching right now, Homo Ludens, takes its name from one of this work. But it is very rare, and it is exceptionally more so for war games. So when I discovered that a French philosopher actually more than wrote about war gaming, but actually designed one, I was instantly fascinated. And this philosopher is Guy Debord. So let's talk a bit about Guy Debord before getting into his game, Le Jeu de la Guerre. Debord made a name for himself in the 1950s, uh, at a time where World War II was over and France was knowing a really massive uh, economical development. At that time, he launched a philosophical movement, uh, I would say on the left side of the political spectrum, called Le Situationnisme. And it's in 1967 when he published his most famous book, La Société du Spectacle, his magnum opus, you could say, uh, where he's putting together this idea that capitalism is starting to colonize our minds through culture. First a book, uh, then a movie, because beyond just writing, uh, Guy Debord saw the importance of creating cultural objects, and he was fascinated by cinema, of course, but he was also fascinated by gaming. And talking about game, what is not well known at all is that for a long part of his career, he's been interested in board game, but interested to a point that he designed one. And he designed one with a particular intent in mind, uh, and that's to actually put into practice a lot of his reflection around uh, strategy and military theory. He saw militantism as an act of warfare almost, uh, and he thought that thinking about strategy in a military sense was key to political success. And all of this came together into his game, Le Jeu de la Guerre. Anyway, I've known about this game for quite a lot of time. I've always wanted to make content about it, but I never really knew how to approach it, uh, especially on a channel that is so focused on, you could say, classical war games, um, commercial war games as we know it today. But I got lucky, uh, and that luck came into the form of figuring out who to invite to come to the show and talk about this game, which I think is probably the best way for me to approach it. So, some years back, uh, there was a digital implementation of uh, the game, uh, and back then I downloaded it and I played it quite a bit with some friends, and it was a great way to get into a game that was really hard to find, and actually the best way to play the game is usually to build it yourself. Uh, but then this digital version of the game uh, got a bit lost uh, in time, I would say. Uh, the team working on it wasn't active anymore, and I haven't heard of it uh, for a while. And then quite recently, um, I saw something on Twitter, I think, uh, talking about a new version, a new better version of that digital implementation. And I reached out to the developer of it, uh, just to have a chat and better understanding what was the... Uh, who was behind this, just um, just out of curiosity. And the good surprise was that the person that was behind the development of this game is uh, a guy called uh, Alexander Galloway. Uh, and Alex is a professor of philosophy at NYU. And just beyond the digital implementation of the game, uh, there is a lot more reflection uh, about Le Jeu de la Guerre uh, from his side. And I connected the dots and realized that I had read an article from Alex uh, some years uh, ago in a book uh, called Zones of Control. Zones of Control is a magnificent book that regroups a lot of articles about wargaming. And in there, there was an article about Le Jeu de la Guerre uh, written by Alex himself. And I thought, well, I think this is the way for me to talk about Le Jeu de la Guerre. So I decided to invite Alex uh, for a long session where we discussed about uh, Guy Debord's work and the role of Le Jeu de la Guerre within his uh, body of work and the history behind the game. And then we had a session. And this is what you're watching right now, a two-part video. First part, you'll have this interview with Alex and second part that will come probably in a couple of weeks where you'll have an actual playthrough of Le Jeu de la Guerre where me and Alex are playing against each other. Hi, Alexander. Thanks for taking the time uh, to talk with me this morning because it's morning for you, mm -hmm. um, early afternoon for, for me. Uh, and before we start this discussion about uh, Le Jeu de la Guerre de Guy Debord, I would like it if you could actually briefly introduce yourself uh, for people to understand uh, better maybe why I invited you to talk about this game today. Sure. I mean, this game is kind of the the rare, like, 
meeting of two interests I have. You know, one interest is sort of, you know, critical theory, French philosophy, the avant-garde, that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm also a kind of self-taught amateur programmer. So I've been involved in, I don't know, different net art, computer art, software art scenes over the years and worked on a variety of different projects. And so this game was an attempt to kind of collide those two universes, I guess. And what do you do in your I was day job? I day job. Yeah, I'm a I'm a professor at New York University in New York. Yeah, and I teach classes about philosophy and theory, media studies, um, and I even teach programming, which is kind of yeah, that's kind of odd and weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to have a teacher of philosophy also teaching programming. What, what languages do you? Uh, well, it's a it's a super super introductory course for people who have no um, background. Um, so we use a language called Processing, uh, which was designed really for artists and designers in mind. You probably have, have heard of Processing. It's originally yeah. based on the Java language, as sort of like a simpler subset of Java. Um, but now there's, I think, a JavaScript implementation and other implementations. So yeah, yeah it's a good it's a good learning language, a uh, good language to learn things in. And I should say, I should probably dredge, dredge up some of the ephemera from the long development cycle of this game. But I did make a very early prototype in processing. You can do a lot in processing, but I sort of maxed out the the like graphical capabilities at a certain point. This was a long time ago, so. Maybe another thing that will help uh, better understand, because I my expectation is that most of the people who are going to watch uh, this video and our discussion probably have no idea what Le Jeu de la Guerre is. Mm. I would say that maybe a bit less, but probably also have limited knowledge about who Guy Debord is. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe that would be a good uh, place to start for us in that discussion about Maybe you exposing a bit um, in uh, in a very introductory way, but who Guy Debord yeah. is and, yeah. and what is Le Jeu de la Guerre? Yeah. So Guy Debord is a you know he's an important figure in the French avant-garde. Um, he's probably best known for being a co-founder of this group called the Situationist International in 1957. Um, if you've encountered Guy Debord before, it probably was because you know you had a a uh, Marxist teacher in college who assigned the Society of the Spectacle, which is by far his most well-known work. Um, he made books. He also made a series of films, which are sort of like experimental, I don't know, didactic films that have sort of interesting formal characteristics. He liked to, now we would call it sampling. He liked to basically steal footage from Hollywood films and other places and kind of cut them up and remix them. So. Uh, one last thing, uh, so I know this is the intro bit that is coming back into the middle of the interview, but I realized that Alex and I are talking about specific things around situationism, and we're talking, we're mentioning already a couple of times this concept of détournement, uh, which is a bit hard for me to translate in English. So I thought the best way for me to show what a détournement is, is actually to show you a small excerpt of a situationist movie from the early 70s, uh, that is taking a kung fu movie, um, a real kung fu movie, and changes all of the dialogues, dubbing them uh, in French, uh, with characters saying things that are radically different from what they originally say in the movie, which is the idea of the détournement. And in this movie, so you have this kung fu setting, and they talk about uh, theory and praxis uh, when it comes to social movement and Marxism. Uh, so this is why this small bit is in there. Enjoy. <laughs> Ainsi, on exerce son matérialisme dialectique. Et pourquoi pas sa subjectivité radicale. Ça pourra toujours servir. Hmm. Pas pour des grèves sauvages, pas pour les occupations d'usines, j'espère, ni pour les incendies des CES. <laughs> so yeah, for people who are interested in gaming and board games, 
Gatorboard's not really on the map unless the situationist folks were really interested in play and kind of this sort of ambient phenomena. And so maybe there's some kind of connection there. But most people didn't really know, and I didn't know, um, that in January 1977, Gatorboard uh, started his own game company, <laughs> which is kind of strange. Uh, and it was called Strategic and Historical Games. Yeah, the um, name is French. It's extremely pompous. It's kind of funny. It's uh, La Société des Jeux Stratégiques et d'Histoire, which is so good. And I'm actually <laughs> wondering if it's still, if they, the rights still exist for it, because if not, I would like to launch a publishing company with the same name. It's really <laughs> epic. Yeah, I tried to find... There was there's some record that said that he, like... Um, took out uh, some kind of um, intellectual property, like he registered the game, it was either a patent or a trademark or something. And so I thought, oh, shit, then there must be a, a record somewhere in the archives. But I never was able to research like the history of French business archives that would have a record of this company actually being incorporated. Um, I did some superficial research, like, you know, through web archives and things like that. But I never did the deep, you know, like, Uh, municipal searches in Paris to try to find this stuff. But theoretically, there are more detailed records about the founding of this company. Um, what we do know is they basically founded the company in order to release this game. And the reports are he also designed a second game. Mm. Um, the game we're going to talk about today is a sort of, um, you know, a kind of uh, strategic war game. And apparently he also made one that was set on the ocean. A, a naval uh, Kriegspiel, <laughs> but um, the rules were never written down. And so uh, that game is essentially lost. I think there are some um, sketches and, and, and things like that for the second game that exist in, in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. But um, yeah, so he founded a game with his benefactor, um, Gerard Lebovici, who was also his main kind of publisher guy. And they made this be absolutely gorgeous, beautiful limited edition made out of copper and silver edition of, I think, four or five um, that was fabricated by a, a metal craftsman. Yeah, they made this game and, and Debord, you know, he was just obsessed with strategy and tactics. And, you know, he thought of himself as a militant and it was unironic, you know, he, he, he was like, if you're a militant, you got to know about strategy and tactics. And the best way to do that is to like study Clausewitz and Napoleon, you know? <laughs> and so that's why he made this game that is a sort of a throwback to, I don't know, like, like uh, you know, um, 19th century style, you know, pitched battle where symmetrical armies, regular armies meet on a field, you know, with artillery and infantry and, and, and battle it out. Yeah, so it's this kind of lost late work by this uh, avant-garde figure I, I embarked on this, basically a kind of a research project to learn about the game, but then also reenact it and get it going again, um, port it to the computer and uh, get it playing on uh, your phone. <laughs> yeah, and we'll come back to that because the, we'll have a, a second part uh, of the video where we'll actually be playing your digital implementation of uh, Le Jeu de la Guerre. I'm, I'm curious. So you said in 77, uh, Guy releases that um, a few copies of this uh, metal brass version of it. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, there is a, a cardboard, more accessible version of the game that is released. Yeah. Uh, my What I'm wondering about is, do we know what the reception uh, of this game was at the time? Because everything that I could find about it, it was that it was pretty niche <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and yeah and i'm wondering like who like like did it have did it like how was it received at at that time yeah i'm trying to recreate the story so so you know lobovici died who's killed and so i think the story was that the publishing house um went into a kind of crisis and um maybe it wasn't super viable to begin with but the publishing house kind of went into a crisis and i think um Guy Debord proposed to uh, explicitly commercialize the game, as you said, in 1987, basically sell, sell, you know, this would be like his monopoly or something. And so, yeah, like you said, they made a, a more kind of commercial version out of cardboard with wood tiles, um, as opposed to this very precious limited edition art object, which 
which was made out of copper and silver. And I did, I've never actually physically seen that commercial edition from 1987 because I don't think any copies really made it to the US, but I have talked with people who said like, oh yeah, you know, I, I just bought a copy from the shop um, and I've seen photo documentation of it, you know, exhaustive photo documentation of it. But there was theoretically a more mass market version that you could, you know, just walk in and, and buy and play. Um, and then actually over the over the years, there have been various kinds of um, sort of bootleg editions. So this is one I think that was made by a group in Berkeley, California. Um, there's a group in the UK called Class War Games that has spent time making a like facsimile edition of the game, except it's much larger, but a physical edition where they play physical um, versions of the game. Um, we'll probably get into us into this, but there's a um, a, a, a British publisher that translated uh, the rules and made this beautiful edition. Um, this is Atlas Press, a beautiful edition that includes actually a playable fold-out board um, yeah, bundled it, it, with the book. It's hard to remove from the from the yeah. from the. the <laughs> <laughs> I should have prepared for this. I, I, uh... um, it's 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 nice. It's you know it has like a sort of playable edition yeah. of the board with physical tokens. Um, along with the rules um, and the translation of, of a, a book, sort of an unusual book, kind of commentary book that uh, Gita Board wrote um, with his wife, Alice Becker Ho. Um, and that book was released sort of in conjunction with the, with the more commercial edition in 1987. Um, and that book is, is a really interesting, unusual book um, because it's, it consists just of like, um, basically screenshots <laughs> of every move uh, throughout the whole book. And then they've um, annotated uh, every position in the game with sort of commentary about, it's like the running commentary, the director's cut or something of um, commenting on strategy and, and things as the game proceeds. Yeah, it looks like a very classic uh, after action report that we see a lot in, in wargaming because it's actually yeah. quite narrative the way it's uh, being the game is being described which is very interesting i think um and we yeah, i wanted to say so that 87 edition in the cardboard edition that they released so i saw a copy of it in an antique shop in paris mm. uh it was an open uh so the, the, you could open <laughs> the box but all the, the 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 wooden pieces were still in their original plastic bag and everything um the thing is that i think the, the person asked, uh, I, I think it was 3,000 euros or something like this. And I was like, no way. Like, I, I would love to have this in my collection as because it's so so unique and everything. But the price was completely insane. Um, and I yeah, couldn't well, figure out if it was really worth it or not. Or, yeah. Uh, I mean, actually. that's the irony of these sort of, you know, radical figures is that yeah. they do get, they do turn into cult figures and, and then their their publications become super expensive and but you know Debord kind of I think wished this upon himself because another little tidbit from his history which helps explain why the game was passed over for so many years is that um, he sort of a few years before he died I think in 1991 he actually basically said like my entire uh, back catalog is going to be destroyed I want to destroy all my existing um, books and he had all of his books pulped, pulped in 1991, including including the remaining copies of this book. And so, um, you know, the game had already been overlooked by most people, right? Games are often um, considered, you know, some people think games aren't as important as, let's say, films or works of philosophy or something. And so the biographers, when they were talking about Gita Board, they would talk about his films and his books, but they would just maybe leave like a paragraph to to the game. Um, which was always disappointing to me, um, but yeah, he you know he he didn't really help um, the long term reception of the game. He publishes the book and then um, four years later says, "I want all my works destroyed." Um, so it took you know a few years for uh, eventually the book was uh, reprinted uh, by Gallimard of all, of all people, uh, uh, which is maybe a f funny uh, historical irony. Um, so, so people have sort of come back to the game and try to, uh, you know, um, excavate details about it, um, which is sort of part of my project to try to reenact the game and get it running again on, on contemporary technology. 
And it's interesting what you're saying, the fact that people who are uh, looking back at Debord or talking about him today or talking about his work and often don't mention uh, Le Jeu de la Guerre uh, mm -hmm. as a big part of his, uh, uh, of his work, uh, body of work. My, my question is, um, first of all, maybe you already touched upon uh, the why, but the first I have is more personal is you yourself, how did you end up uh, discovering the the game because we talked a bit before the stream how I discovered it and it was it, it was a complete accident it mm -hmm. was at, because of the exhibition at the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale uh, I think it was in 2013 or something like this and there was this actually the the metal version of the game in the middle of the exhibition and it was the first time that I realized that Guy Debord made a game but I was wondering how how did you stumble across uh, that part of his work question I I I'm I'm not sure I can actually remember but i i think it was because i was reading a book by richard barbrook who i i guess is a british uh, i think he's originally british um sort of scholar and leftist and i was reading a book by him and there was just kind of a passing reference to it and it just jumped off the page i was like are you kidding me you know gita board made a game uh and i've never heard of this before um and so i started following the thread and the thread started to unravel even more. Um, at that point, the the correspondence of Guy Debord had been published in French, and so I I like multi volume like seven volumes or something absurd like that. And so I combed through all of that and found every existing reference to the game. Um, I combed through all of his publications. The game is even depicted in in at least one of his films, um, and is referenced, um, including uh, with with images in some of his books. So I sort of collected this dossier of um, primary materials. Um, and actually since then, the Bibliothèque Nationale has made more material available that has come from the estate um, of Guy Debord. So uh, yeah, it just, it just was a kind of lucky thing that I found through, I believe, Richard Barbrook's book. Um, and he also was an inspiration, I think, for this group. Uh, class war games that I said made the large large scale facsimile edition and would hold like game, gaming nights to play the game. They they also released the book in 2014, I think. Uh, I haven't read it, but I know it's still available and I probably would have a, a look at it. And they had this website for a while, but I think it's been inactive for the last four yeah. or five years. Yeah, I was I was never really tight with that group, but I always appreciated what they were what they were doing and, and wish I had more more contact with them. Yeah. Uh, but and, and going back to 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 Guy Debord himself, how important do you feel uh, this work is uh, within the whole context of what he did over the course mm. of his life? I know that he often some described himself as a strategist. He mm -hmm. had kind of an obsession for Clausewitz, mm -hmm. uh, and in a way, it feels like that this is. Uh, very significant for someone who sees himself as a strategist that is really interested in, in, in like you say, military uh, theory or war theory or something like this. How important do you think is this uh, within? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I wish I could say I thought it was important because I think actually the game is um, in many ways an anomaly. Um, Although maybe if through a kind of deeper analysis or a deeper read, there is a continuity, right? Um, so I'll say why there's a continuity and then why I think it's more of an anomaly. I mean, the continuity is, like you said, Gita Bord was, I think, pretty unironically obsessed with Clausewitz, the military theorist, and also Napoleon. Um, he was obsessed with Hegel. Uh, he was sort of interested in a kind of, I don't know, a heroic, glorious form of militancy. Um, you know, I mean, the cavalry, like, you know, marching in, 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 in Curtiz's film, The Charge of the Light Brigade. These are, this is some of the footage that he stole from Hollywood and put in his films. And there's some line where he says basically this this cavalry unit is sort of like you know the march of the Situationist International and you know maybe he was being ironic but I think he I think he really believed it you know he he was sort of he loved the like thrill of militancy and, and protest and the ra the radical gesture right so there's that but um, I think ultimately it's more of an anomaly because. Um, 
if people talk about the situation is international, they talk about things like, um, you know, so-called hijacking, right, detournement, or they talk about these these sort of um, these sort of drifting methods that they would incorporate, um, derive, or they talk about um, this notion of psychogeography, right? And so a lot of the rhetoric around the SI is about play and associative relations and kind of reorganizing um, the, the kind of staid, static, oppressive, you know, traditional French society. And none of those qualities are evident in the game of war. <laughs> it's almost exactly the opposite. It's super, super structured. Uh, it's very, very rigid and formal in its, in its construction. It's, it's fairly kind of deterministic, I would say. Like there's no dice involved, so there's no randomness, um, except for the opening move. You roll a dice to see who goes first, but there's no dice in the combat mechanic, um, which is, I think, important. Um, the, only, the only kind of like um, tangential remote sort of thing that would maybe connect it with this more sort of flexible, kind of fluid, rhizomatic, um, aesthetics is that the game has one very important um, aspect to it, which is that Debord called them the lines of communication. And so he uses sort of like the notion of a logistical supply line from like Napole Napoleon's campaigns. And that becomes like an aspect of gameplay. So superimposed on the battlefield is basically a kind of like network of supply lines. And you can move those lines in very particular ways. And strategy, your strategy involves keeping all of your units directly connected to one of those supply lines. And so I kind of maybe, maybe this is too much of a, of a leap or something, but I sort of see this as a, a way in which the board allowed kind of network thinking and the kind of new network age that was growing up around him in the 70s and 80s. And, and again, it's a throwback to Napoleon and, and the logistic, the notion of a logistical supply line in the battlefield. But I, I also see it as a kind, of, a, a kind of simple way of thinking about networks and allowing that kind of you know, post-Fordist network economic thinking to like create this game that we could maybe informally call like chess with networks. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, there is, a, and so you're touching upon two things uh, here that I would like to deep dive a bit more uh, into. I would keep the communication part and the superimposition of the two layers in the game for for my for my follow up question because I think there is something really interesting to deep dive into. The first one is, you say that in a way it's an anomaly within his work because it is so formal uh, and all this. And I think one of the things that surprised me the most uh, when I when I tried the game for the first time is this rigidity, how mm. old school it is. Um, and even if you think about Kriegspiel, uh, where it comes from, as you say, the, the combat is deterministic. And one of the big evolution of Kriegspiel uh, in, in, in the early 19th century, when it was finally adopted by the Prussian army, is that they introduced randomness because it, they felt like it was actually a better depiction of friction uh, mm -hmm. yeah, in conflict. Good. And what he's actually going back to is something even more old school than actual Kriegspiel, but the early evolutions of chess that happened just before uh, Kriegspiel, ah, like the game okay. of Helvig and stuff like this. Yeah. Very deterministic, just chess with more squares, a chess mm -hmm. with terrain in some of the squares and more diverse yeah. units. But <laughs> it is extremely old school. And the thing that struck me, I was like, wait a minute. So from what I hear is that in 76, he releases the metal version of it, but mm -hmm. there are some traces that, and I might be wrong, but that he had maybe have been working on it since yes. the late 60s, uh, something uh, like this. I believe the first, the, he, I think he said he first started thinking about it in f the 50s, 54 even. It's and and that, that makes my point even stronger then, because yeah. I'm thinking during that whole period, what was around him, he's a leftist. And from mm -hmm. a leftist point of view, what was happening around him was guerrilla warfare, mm, uh, yes. wars against, coloni uh, uh, yes. against colonialism, a lot of asymmetry. Uh, different way to wage war. If you think about, for me, what I find really interesting is that at the same time he was thinking about this game, there were people that were actually putting into practice Klausowitz's uh, rules, 
like for example, GIAP, uh, the the general in Vietnam uh, that mm -hmm. that led the French to their defeat and everything. Mm -hmm. Like he was obsessed with Clausewitz, but the way he mm -hmm. integrated Clausewitz into his mode of thinking was practicing the small war, uh, the the the, the guerrilla warfare, and then trying to find that big moment. But he he twisted the application of it, not really twisted, mm -hmm. but really fully embraced the situation in which he was in and and applied based on the material situation he was in, the thinking of Klosowitz to his own situation. Mm -hmm. And then I look at Guy Debord's game. He was surrounded by this during the whole time he was designing the I game. Know. And what he comes up with is something that is really late 18th century. And I'm like, yeah. how anachronistic is that? He must yeah. have, like, he yeah. went like he went through the whole war in Algeria, the war in uh, uh, Indochine. Uh, and then he saw the other things that after mm -hmm. like the war in Vietnam, how could he come up with something yeah. that is so, well, not even warfare anymore uh, yeah. for him for for what was what was his society was going through? How how can we explain that? Yeah, it's an excellent point. You said anachronistic. I would totally agree. Um, I think in in my book, I, the the expression I use is that it it's a nostalgic algorithm meaning that, like you said, it's nostalgic for an older style of warfare that really reached its peak sort of, yeah, in the late 18th century and into the 19th century. And you're absolutely right. He's surrounded by all these sort of uh, forms of war that are, that are asymmetrical, that involve irregular combatants. Um, even, you know, the dawning of the age of terrorism um, you mentioned Algeria and um, Indochine and, and other. So, yeah, that's that's the big mystery. Uh, and that's why I think it's more anomalous um, that he sort of looks around him and then he makes a game that doesn't model those <laughs> that scenario at all. <laughs> and then the the second part the, the, that I would like to, that I had a hard time grasping is, yes, it is a, a, anachronistic. Uh, it is extremely formal. But, it, but then there is this mechanic, the line of communication mechanic. Yeah. That is so odd, and it, because it it adds an anachrony within an anachrony because <laughs> those relays are instantaneous; they go across the board. Yeah. You have yeah. to block them, but if yeah. not, they are like you can activate uh, units yeah. across yeah. the whole board. And it's like, well, that's radio communication. Yeah. In a way, you could say that it's an abstraction of culture. Um, yeah. And I was thinking when I was playing the game, it reminded me, and I'm not sure that he was reading this at the time, or maybe I'm seeing too much into it. But it reminded me of, of uh, Gramsci and his idea of war of position mm. and war of movement. Yeah. And war of position is around the culture and 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 shifting a bit uh, the culture of a whole society toward uh, more progressive ideas. And war yeah. of movement is actual conflict and revolution and the two need to articulate each other. Mm. And when you're playing the game, you really feel like, wait, this could be war of position. Like I'm making sure that I'm communicating at the right place at the right time to yeah. actually being able to push when it's when it's when it's when it's relevant uh, start the, the war of movement yeah and and i'm thinking well it also makes think that he worked a lot on on the importance of culture himself uh, uh this idea that everything is a spectacle and that capitalism is going into even our own like colonizing our own dreams and and mm -hmm. aspiration do you think there is this in there or it's or or, or like, was he trying to make a point about other points that he was making in, in the rest of his body of work? Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's hard. I mean, I've, I've tried to find those connections and I haven't honestly found a lot of them. Um, I think the game, the game of war is, 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 is super abstract. And um, you said position and I like that a lot. I think, yeah, I would agree. I think the game is um, very spatial. It's you know how some games are are about sort of proximity and orientation and angle, line of sight, that kind of stuff. This game is very much about those sort of spatial dynamics. And so the way you win is you, or the way you you know have you learn how to be a good player is to have a, a sense of like proximity and orientation. And oh, have I advanced too far? Therefore, my rear side is is vulnerable. Um, and so if your brain works in a spatial way, um, this game will really kind of like, you know, 
touch that that side of of, of how your brain works. Um, and I was thinking it's interesting what you're saying about spatial and and that that we can see actually in your article in zones of control because you you represent the geometry of pieces on yeah. the board in pure abstract just as yep. vectors so you can yep. see actually the lines. Yep. And what it made me think about I don't know if you play Go, but in the game of Go you have this idea that. Um, you're you're going for a good shape, uh, a mm -hmm. shape that is extremely efficient with as yeah. many stones as possible, and you have to learn. You train your eye in recognizing good and bad shapes mm -hmm. uh, to see where you can uh, stop playing and start focusing your attention somewhere else, and see the weaknesses in the shape of your yeah. opponent. And I feel like in mm -hmm. the way this game has this, just the mm -hmm. difference with Go is that the shapes can move, uh, which yeah. is which yeah. is quite fun. Yeah. Um, and I and I hope that we'll see that in the in the in the when we are going to play the game in the, yeah. the second yeah, part yeah. but that gave, makes me my transition towards your article uh in 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 zones of uh zones of control so can you tell us a bit more about uh, the article that that you wrote about the about the game then yeah so so you know i had i had built a prototype uh in software uh almost 10 years ago now and then it the code got old and it and it stopped running and so the newer version that we're going to play is a kind of reboot of that older prototype so i had done sort of software investigations in the game and learned a lot that way um, but this article i wrote which then was expanded into a chapter in, in this book called uncomputable is really a uh not about the software game it's more about gita board and the game that he designed and i kind of um I mean, the 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 sort of gambit is is that I organize the article around a kind of mystery, and to try to solve this mystery. And the mystery is based on this book, which is the documentation of a match. Um, who who played which side in this match, and what does that reveal to us about gameplay, gameplay styles? And so, like you mentioned, I did a series of kind of simple diagrammatic drawings of the different strategies as they unfold in the game and to try to make a kind of signature a kind of profile or play signature of each player and it was very clear almost immediately that one player had a highly um, kind of structured um, play style that was um, if you know how the game works was basically like min maxing the the game algorithm. So this was someone who was trying to basically fully, fully optimize the combat mechanic, fully optimize, you know, how um, the units are able to control space. Um, and then there was another player who was maybe more, a little bit more um, kind of loose about those, those less stringent about uh, kind of min-maxing the game mechanic. Anyway, so I use that as a kind of mystery to try to unfold, um, you know, who played which side and what does that reveal about um, about gameplay. Um, but one interesting thing that came up in in this in this investigation and actually having coded it in software was the only way that I was able to unearth this. Um, and some other people who were playing with me at the time also helped, which is that uh, one of the players in this book like cheats all the time, like one out of every eight moves has an incorrect move. And I say cheats, I'm, I'm kind of being hysterical a little bit, but there are a lot of bugs. We would say maybe bugs. There are a lot of errors. There are some just straight up typos. So, okay, who cares? But there are a lot of moves that are technically um, uh, you're unable to make if you make it, if you have a strict interpretation of the rules. And, and maybe ju just for context, <clears throat> for people to understand that we're talking about lines of communication and all of your units need to be connected yes. either to directly to a line of communication or to another unit that is connected to a kind of line of communication for you to be able to make a move. Correct. And and within the after action report that, that is in the book, some moves are impossible because at the moment when those units are moving, at that time, they are not in communication yet. Yeah. And the sequence of moves are, are not possible. Yeah, right. And so I had, when I, when I first had a, a prototype running in software, uh, my first idea, of course, was like, okay, I, I should just replay this famous game, you know, and get a documentation of this famous 1987 game. And that would just be a fun first kind of exercise to do. And so I did. I replayed the game diligently, you know, page by page, moved the piece on the computer, turned the page of the book, moved the piece. And I hit these 
these moments where I couldn't actually move the piece because you know I had designed the rules in software. Software is very rigid; it doesn't give you much flexibility. And so it was actually the prototype uh, software version <laughs> that found all the all the all the bugs in the book, which is a kind of funny um, a funny outcome. Um, so anyway, that sort of figures into this article that I wrote. And the the juicy little tidbit is that only one of the players makes all these mistakes. And the other player doesn't make any mistakes. <laughs> so that also kind of figures into the argument that I that I try to make in the book about it. So, and your argument is that Guy Debord, that is min-maxing every move, but at the same time cheating with the yeah. lines of communication. <laughs> which so is this common, is Guy Debord himself, because he knows is, the game really well, but at the same time cheats or forgets rules about his own game. Yeah, I mean, it, it is counterintuitive, because you, you the first thought would be, ah, the person who makes these sort of like, um, you know, minor blunders mm -hmm. would be the one who doesn't know the game as well, right? So, okay, I'm sure I was... Becker Ho knew how to play the game really well, but like she wasn't the one who had been designing it in her head since the 50s and then had released it. So clearly Guy Debord knew the game much, much more intimately than she did, right? So the first idea is that if you knew the game intimately, you'd never make these mistakes, right? But, you know, as a anyone who's written code, you know that there are lots of errors and bugs that as a programmer, you can identify easy on the screen yeah. you just see them but there are tons and tons of bugs and code uh, bugs in code that um, are not really don't reveal themselves either they're too technical and you just miss them or they're not static what we call static meaning sort of you have to actually run the code in order for the bug to be revealed like in active runtime and so yeah my my sort of analogy is that Gita board is 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 in in some ways more like a, a computer programmer in the sense that um, he probably was extremely good at the game, but like all of us, was not able to find all the bugs, right? Mm. Because he he didn't have, he wasn't a, a machine, you know, he wasn't actually running the software. And then, you know, the punchline is that he's actually the one, if you believe my argument, uh, he's actually the one who loses the game. So he, he's, he's the ultimate, uh, you know, he, he throws in the towel at the end of the book. Um, and that's, I think, maybe some way to kind of add a a tragic uh, minor whimper of an ending to his like heroic arc as an as an avant-garde filmmaker and author. And and I would say that I re I really think you make a good point uh, in the in the article about probably him being the the player. And I think for a few reasons, the one that you laid definitely. But I would also say that there is a few things that I think give give a few good hints. So first of all, I would say that personally, as a game designer. I know that I'm typically the kind of person, and I've seen other designers doing the same thing, being really good at their game, but making constant small mistakes that mm. they are, are always being corrected by people who had to learn the game and don't have the game in their head, yeah. uh, which is a big difference. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not surprised. And when you see those type of rules, you're like, yeah, that's definitely a rule, a designer's mistake. It really feels like it. Yeah. And and the other thing is how harsh he is at the end about the, the, yeah. the losing side. You're like, he's not talking about his wife right now. He's talking <laughs> about himself. Like he, you can see that you're like, Yep, I can I can see that I I, I can yeah, I recognize some people in there like people yeah. who are highly critical of their own work and yeah. and it, it really feels that way it's 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 a bit funny and a bit sad at the same time um, yeah it, and then actually someone pointed out to me I felt really embarrassed after doing all this work you know this this like murder mystery and thinking mm -hmm. that I had some genius solution to it and then someone pointed out to me I don't know if you can see it but there's one very famous photo of of Alice Becker Ho and Guy Debord oh, playing the game. Yeah. This is actually a cropped version, but it's a it's a beautiful black and white photograph of them playing. Uh, it's the most common image you will ever find if you Google the game or if you. And seen I it. think it's the one that is on the yeah that's on the, the latest book of Emmanuel Guy. Yeah, yeah, so it's a beautiful image. Um, and somebody pointed out to me that Guy Debord's playing the south position in that in that photo, which is the the case I'm trying to make. And so it's very possible that that. Photo that is the game is is taken from the game the, this famous game from 1987 so i could have just you know not written the article and just looked at the photograph and then yeah you went into whole computer analysis <laughs> mode and you could just look at pictures yeah <laughs> well even if i'm wrong even if the argument is wrong which i could be completely wrong um it's still a kind of just an excuse to go down this path 
and yeah. and learn about strategic thinking and what does it mean to sort of create a signature of a play style and how does that reveal deeper insights into games and play and i would definitely say that i thought reading your article was extremely exciting like i, I really i really loved uh, uh, reading it and zones of control overall is an amazing book there is a mm, lot of good stuff is. in there but i think this is one of the reason that you need to get the book also because oh, there thanks. is this article about something so unique that you don't learn about that often and the approach that you have and it, it's it's extremely it, it's extremely fun uh, I was fascinated by 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 that article. It's so, a good collection, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good collection, definitely. I have a, um, uh, another question regarding Guy Debord. Uh, so we talked about how anachronic uh, his game was because of what was happening at the time and everything. But there is also something else that was happening at that time, especially in the 60s and the 70s, is that the first golden age of war games, uh, mm. uh, classic Hex Encounter, uh, war games, Avalon Hill stuff. And even in France, like we, we had some, some companies that were actually publishing war games at those time. Mm. Uh, maybe Descartes was uh, coming later, but there were still some, some war games that existed. There was a, a big community that was pretty linked to um, uh, RPGs originally and that branched out like in the US, but there was a, a, big, uh, a big community of war gamers. Do we know that if Guy Debord, maybe not even specifically war games, but was he playing? Uh, commercial mm. board games at the time? Uh, and if so, which ones and what did he think about them? And did he had any experience with actual war games that were released also at the time when he was working on this? Yeah, um, I, I probably can't give a definitive deep answer to that, but I do know some, some simple things. One is, um, yes, he was into playing games. And in, in the letters, there's also reference to another game called Jambi. Um, that he was playing at the time, which, which I read a little bit about in the piece. Um, it's a game that does actually try to utilize like sort of just diegetically some of the aspects of contemporary life. So you can play as like a, like a agent provocateur and you can play as like a journalist, I think. And, and so on. So we know that he was playing that he didn't really like it, um, but he didn't like most things. So that, that doesn't really matter. That's one note. And then the other note is I haven't actually seen it in person, but apparently he had a whole collection of little um, mini fix. Yeah. Little, yeah. little, little army, army guys. Uh, and they've been preserved. They're in the Bibliothèque Nationale, like in a little shoebox, and you can go look at them. <laughs> so <laughs> there is some sort of anecdotal evidence, at least that he was, you know, playing Kriegspiel of, of and various kinds. And the fact that he was playing maybe uh, toy soldiers reminds of uh, George Orwell. Like he had also this uh, th this obsession with toy soldiers, and he wrote uh, Little Wars. This uh, mm. this rule set. I actually like the idea of Kida Bor playing uh, George Orwell uh, rule ah. set. With, oh, with I didn't know that. I have to look that up. That's yeah, that's yeah. I, I would send you the a link afterwards. Uh, that's yeah, the the Little War uh, rule set. And, he and I should actually, say, I'm I'm not an expert on board games. Um, I have you know thought about uh, computer games and video games. Um, but that is not necessarily the same context. So. And but I think in in that you would be interested because because it was also a reflection for for him. It was not just about having fun. Of course, it was one of the reason having fun with friends uh, in a in uh, uh, in a, a casual setting, like not and he, like he liked uh, unironically like reenacting war with small mm -hmm. soldiers. But he really thought that his game was making a point around about the the violence and the absurdity of war. Mm -hmm. And that if you played the game enough, you would realize how yeah. war is a bad idea and you should I never see. do it. And war should remain as a, a, a small game in, in your apartment or in your house, but should never uh, uh, do anything else than that, which is so, which is quite of interesting. So there is a there is so a, it's like a didactic, like news gaming, like uh, pedagogical gaming. <laughs> yeah, a, a bit like the original Monopoly showing that, well, uh, <laughs> having landlords is a problem and it's yeah. going to uh, naturally uh, evolve into concentration of wealth. Uh, yeah. So the, the original game and this was the same idea. So. Uh, this idea of using games to actually prove a point um, mm, yeah. was was quite interesting. Regarding this, maybe a more of a, a personal question to you is, do you feel like gaming? And I know that you you just said you're not big on gaming, but based on what you've done around the work that you've done around uh, Guy Debord's work and everything, that game can be a, a powerful or useful tool um, 
either to convey ideas or to, mm. to reflect on them, maybe have a bit of practice and not only theory for mm. philosophers and maybe to extend mm. it to political, for political mm. activists? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, games are one of the best ways to uh, internalize and experiment and play with um, complex systems, right? And that's super important. I mean, even if you're just playing chess or, you know, if you're playing Fortnite or whatever, you know, you're dealing with like multiple variables that are interacting in super complicated ways. And, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not linear and didactic and, um, you know, in, in the way that like reading a treatise or reading a philosophical text is, but, oh yeah, no, I, I am absolutely convinced that there is, um, you know, significant rational, uh, but also, you know, sort of affective stuff that happens when you're, when you're playing. Absolutely. Um, and I also say just to follow up, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, people, people say, oh, I'm not a technical person or I don't know how to code or whatever, but you know, you show me a gamer and I'll show you a, a de facto computer programmer you know like if you're if you're good at gaming that means you're very good at manipulating a complex symbolic system and that's super important for contemporary life and maybe one last question and before we jump into the game is uh so you made this video game adaptation uh do you know who's playing le jeu de la guerre today is it still being played is there and you were showing that there was a few uh attempts at, at making like um, a pirate version of the game and everything. So I guess there was probably an audience at some point of people yeah. interested into the, in, in the situation is international, but the, is there still a community today of people playing Le Jeu de la Guerre? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I definitely get emails from like, um, you know, people who have an interest in Guy Debord. Um, so there's a lot of sort of like anarchists and latter day situationist people who are interested in, in situationism who kind of come to it. But it seems to be a sort of loose tapestry uh, of people who maybe aren't all in contact with one another. Um, yeah, I occasionally get emails from people like that and correspond with people like that. And so the the software version, the, the computer version, I guess will be a kind of experiment. You know, right now there's about 100, 150 people beta testing it and I'm right on the verge of really just launching it <laughs> onto the app store. And so we'll see at that point. I mean, I'm not, I don't think it'll be a runaway success, but um, it, it is a pretty fun playable game. And so I don't think you have to be like a nerdy graduate student who's interested in obscure French avant-garde figures uh, to find the game interesting. <laughs> and this will be a kind of test of whether that's the case or not. 